I have been asked to address the question, how can community support for the nuclear option be achieved? It's an important question. A lot of people would stop me right there and say, forget it, it can't be. I'm pleased to say that I know differently. Today, I'm going to walk you through a model for achieving community support for the nuclear option. The model is based on risk communication theory and reinforced by my experience as an advocate of nuclear power in Australia. Everything that I have ever learned from a book, I have applied in my work. What I am here to tell you is not a maybe. This works. The first thing to be understood is that there is a wrong way to go about it. The really sad part is that I expect this is very familiar. We need to find a way to convince Australians to embrace an unpopular energy source. Nuclear power is a necessary evil if we are to maintain reliable energy supply while meeting our commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is wrong in every which way. It's based on false premises. It's ponderous in tone. It's utterly lacking in vision and it presupposes that anyone cares about politicized emissions targets. It is, to be perfectly frank, a big, fat downer. Basing an effort on this approach would be a demoralizing waste of time. We can, and we must, do better. This is what the right way looks like. This is what I have researched and applied in a journey that has brought me in front of you today. Community support for the nuclear option is achieved when you hit the mark on all of these themes. Screwing up any of these is likely to deliver a flash in the pan. They all matter. They all need to be covered all of the time, every time. I'll discuss them in a sequence that is somewhat logical but is not rigidly important in their application. First, we have to acknowledge the support that already exists. We keep hearing that nuclear power is an unpopular option. Says who? Support in Australia dipped after Fukushima and has since rebounded. At this time, nuclear is no more unpopular than it is popular, and there is a large undecided block. Assuming that everyone hates nuclear leads to approaches that are either overly apologetic or else brash and combative. Neither is helpful. Neither is necessary. We can and should operate from an understanding that there is a strong and consistent base of support in the community already and approach the task with positivity, confidence, and sincerity. When we do that, amazing things happen. Here are the results from a debate here in Sydney at this time last year. An even three-way split moved strongly to nuclear power as an option in the course of an hour and a half of discussion. So not only is there support, this support grows with good discussion. That's hugely encouraging. But the risk is to imagine that this is just all about education. It isn't. Information only matters once people are ready to listen. In getting people ready to listen, information is almost irrelevant. There may be existing support. Australia may have a blank slate regarding nuclear power. But we can take no more for granted than that. This discussion will begin with all the encumbrances of the previous decades. What matters is how we approach those encumbrances. I know as well as anyone, and better than most, that a lot of rubbish is spoken about nuclear power a lot of the time. I also know that a lot of concerns are legitimate, true, fair, and based in fact. Advocates simply must occupy the middle ground in this discussion. The only way to do this is to acknowledge the genuine shortcomings of nuclear energy early and often. 
Frankly, there is no reason not to keep going until people get bored with talking about the shortcomings. Because the point is, it's the community that tells us when they are ready to hear our information. There is no other chain of events for building community support through knowledge development. Presuming to inform before you have established trust is the biggest mistake to make. If advocates establish trust and occupy the middle ground through sincere engagement and ready acknowledgement, it really does not take long before people start asking themselves some very sensible questions about nuclear power. It doesn't take much longer for them to ask us those sensible questions and actually want to hear our answers. Once we have reached that position, information can do the job of knowledge development. Make no mistake, there is a job to be done. 38% of respondents to this 2012 survey believe nuclear to be the most dangerous power source. The opposite is true. The same survey found 65% of respondents believe a nuclear power plant has the potential to explode like a nuclear warhead or bomb. Objecting to nuclear power sounds like the most sensible thing in the world. We do need knowledge development. For nuclear power, the keys are context and comparison. Without the necessary context, it can be very difficult to grasp the need for nuclear power in the first place. With the context, like the breakdown of our electricity production and the trajectory of our emissions, that need becomes much clearer. The second essential step is comparison. This is everything. Figures about anything in our energy decision-making, on their own, devoid of context, are completely meaningless. It is only through comparison of our options that we can provide information to help Australians make sense of this. That's why I produced the Zero Carbon Options Report with the able assistance of James Brown. We directly compared a reference renewable solution against a reference nuclear solution in the task of replacing a coal plant. Conceptually, this is simple to the point of being obvious. Yet it had never been done before. We compared the options against 13 relevant criteria. I won't go through the outcomes in detail, but I will say this. The process of comparison makes it very clear that the arbitrary exclusion of nuclear power at a time when decarbonization is urgent is a very expensive policy position indeed. This type of information builds knowledge, bringing the ability to make better decisions. Once we are getting good information out to receptive listeners, there is also the important job of contesting bad information. I must be clear, I am not talking about opinions that differ from mine or chains of reasoning that lead to different conclusions. I am talking about bad information. I am talking about junk that is every bit as pernicious as the worst of climate change denial. A cornerstone of opposition to nuclear power is the idea that it's dangerous. The logical way to test this is, once again, through comparison. We establish how much harm energy sources are responsible for, normalize that harm for the amount of energy each produces, and come up with mortality tables, cheerfully called death prints. I'll show you several. This is probably the very best source, the findings of the Extern E project cited in the medical journal Lancet. You can see that both accidents and pollution are accounted for, and you can see that nuclear is the best performing of those assessed. This is the Energy-Related Severe Accident Database, one of the inputs to Extern E, with a focus on severe accidents. The same result is shown. This is work published in Forbes in 2012 by author James Conca. 
Conca's effort states that nuclear is better performing than even wind and solar power. It's my opinion that the distinction is pretty academic compared with the epic harm of fossil fuels, particularly coal. But it's an interesting contention. So on the basis of this work, the contention that nuclear power is dangerous is actually and factually unsupportable. Which begs the question, how did activist group Choose Nuclear Free, an initiative of Friends of the Earth and others, which hosts a statement against nuclear power signed by nearly every major and minor ENGO in Australia, produce this table? According to this table, which was publicly available in a briefing paper and referenced in numerous locations in online media, nuclear power is equally or more dangerous than coal. According to Extern E, nuclear is between 10 and 600 times safer than coal. It turns out that in converting these sources from terawatt-hours to gigawatt-years, they multiplied instead of divided. These numbers are incorrect by a factor of 77. Furthermore, the factors applied to nuclear are a blend of three unrelated references with no formal peer review to assure us that this methodology has any solid basis at all. It's junk. The paper has now been withdrawn, but the table can still be found embedded in other articles at other sites. So, to be clear, while there is every reason for humility and inclusive processes, there is no obligation whatsoever to let bad information stand, or to accept as fair and reasonable the participation of parties who insist on producing and using bad information. We must insist on basic standards in relation to the information that is permitted to guide discussions. We can do this with confidence. The great majority of Australians will join us in the middle ground for a grown-up discussion among grown-ups. Finally, we must provide Australia with a positive vision on which to hang this conversation. There is little that is persuasive for the community at large about a piecemeal and weak-kneed approach that leads to an inevitable shit-fight to build a single facility many years from now. We instead need to consider, what can nuclear power mean for Australia? We need to talk about securing a manufacturing and industrial base that will remain carbon competitive through this century. We need to talk about the reality that success is not achieved in half measures. This has been demonstrated by France, where a mix of nuclear and hydropower has all but eliminated fossil fuels and carbon emissions from electricity generation. We can talk about greenhouse gas-free desalination, enabling us to adapt to climate change without making it worse, enabling us to draw on the technology of desalination with more confidence for a longer time and a greater range of applications. We need to talk about portable, compact, zero-carbon power for settlements, regions, or off-grid applications. We need to talk about the high-tech, knowledge-based jobs that we can add to our nation through value-adding across the nuclear fuel cycle. We need to pair our decarbonized energy vision with that of a decarbonized transport sector, with clean energy available on demand for as many electric vehicles as Australia can take. We need our conversation to break through politicized emissions targets to instead talk about strong decarbonization outcomes. We need to talk about being first in line with some of the world's best technology that will change our country for the better. We need to talk about taking regional leadership in securing a plentiful energy future that runs on what others call nuclear waste. We need to tell Australians that we can clear our air of the harm of mining and burning coal.
We can secure community support. It's about trusting Australians, inviting them to join a conversation, establishing common ground, acknowledging legitimate concerns, providing the information that they need, paired with a powerful, positive vision. There is a wrong way, and there is a right way. Let's choose the right way. My very deepest thanks to ATSE for providing such a professional forum for us to have these discussions.